Temperature loggers are a common tool grain growers use as part of their frost risk management. So with the data loggers, you probably need 20 or 30 or 40 of them through your paddocks and that creates a lot of work every month or so to go and download them. It's a workload that increases with the frequency of frost events. In this environment, they could be getting 20 or 30 frosts a year and, and to get rapid identification of, of temperature across the landscape is, is really critical for them. So what if there was a tool that could rapidly identify where a crop has been exposed to damaging frost? Well, that tool's been developed and this is what the information it generates looks like when animated. So this is now 9pm and we can see the reds indicating temperatures above zero and the blues are indicating temperatures that are below zero. The tool uses modelling to analyse temperature data from field sensors together with spatial and terrain data. So what we're referring to when we're talking about spatial uh, data is spa data that's got a, a geographic component or has a latitude and a longitude or a place on a map. And then we use the terrain data, the elevation of the height of the land, the variability in elevation in an area or the range of elevation in an area. We use those extensively in this work to relate the temperatures to, to the terrain itself. David Gobbert is a spatial data analyst and a member of the CSIRO team working on frost mapping. It's one of a number of projects related to GRDC's key investment target strategy for frost. The little crosses here show where loggers were actually deployed in the paddocks. Up to 100 temperature loggers were deployed at each of two trial sites. This one in South Australia's northeastern cropping zone, the second at Hopeton in Victoria. And this animation is, is taken from the data of each of these loggers that was uh, recorded every 30 minutes. By animating the data, it helped illustrate temperature behaviour across variable terrain on a frosty night. Part of what we found particularly interesting with these is the sort of ebbs and flows of, of temperature. So in this case, by three o'clock, almost the entire area is covered in below zero temperatures. Strangely, then at about 4.30 at night, there's some sort of warming, and then by six o'clock, it's cooled down again. So there's very little wind on this night, but perhaps it was enough to cause a bit of air mixing. And then by 7.30, the sun's coming up and you get a few residual pockets that last a while with sub-zero, and then the whole area warms up. This also highlighted the difference between on-farm weather observations compared to a district observation, which grain growers normally rely on. So, for example, here in Mintaro, in the mid-north of South Australia, if you're farming there, your nearest Bureau of Meteorology weather station is about 15 kilometres away, and it's over a range of hills. So it really doesn't tell a farmer in Mintaro what has happened on their properties that night. The overnight minimum at the Mintaro trial site, when the animation's data was recorded, was minus 1.2 degrees. Over the hills at Clare, 15 kilometres away, the Bureau's weather station recorded an overnight low of 2 degrees, just over 3 degrees warmer. While CSIRO used up to 100 loggers to record temperatures, that was only necessary to build the data set for the model. In practice, gathering data would be a much less labour-intensive system for a grain grower, as the model, together with a low-cost automated weather station, would replace the loggers. Access to a high-quality Bureau of Meteorology compliant weather station, such as this one, could be combined with ground truthing to further refine the temperature mapping algorithms, resulting in even greater benefits for grain growers. OK, so an example of how this model might be used in, in practice, which would be down the track a bit, would be for a farmer to have a, a single weather station with telemetry that enabled the temperatures to be transmitted to a central point. When that minimum temperature is received, the model can be used to, to generate a map and then sent back to the farmer by whatever method they prefer. And so by sometime the next morning, they would have a map of temperatures across their farm. Agricultural advisor Mick Faulkner is collaborating with growers, Agriculture Victoria and the University of Western Australia on the mapping project's second component, using the electromagnetic spectrum to recognise and assess frost-damaged plant tissue. 
really looking for the wavelengths in the uh, EM spectrum that, that might indicate that a plant has had some freezing damage. The hope is to be able to use it with some sort of remote sensing, but we just don't know if that's possible as yet. Certainly with the PhD students um, at UWA and what we've been able to achieve here, we have found some signal differences and I think that that's positive. What both components of the frost mapping project could also provide is data to help make immediate crop management decisions, such as to cut a damaged cereal crop for hay, and to plan longer term farming system strategies. Hopefully in the future we can use this uh, modelling to help us base some decisions like uh, taking canola and certain crops out of the zone where we know we're going to have a chance of getting frosted and even as far as maybe variable rate seeding some paddocks and with changing varieties in paddocks to try and minimise the frost risk and try and maximise potential for production. Whenever the modelling tool becomes available, it will have national application, but it will be just one tool in the frost management toolkit, albeit a powerful one. We have data layers of yield maps, we have now data layers hopefully of temperature modelling from CSRO and maybe another data layer is some sort of damage assessment due to sensors. You start putting all those data layers together and then the tool is so much more powerful in terms of forward planning and some sort of response to frost when they occur. Go to the description bar below for the latest information, links and resources.